Let us pray. Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. Well, my sermon title this week, Taking It to the Streets, uh, is I look at the verses, I play with different words to see how they'll work. And for those of you who are music fans, do you recognize the title? Okay, the Doobie Brothers definitely come to mind immediately, right? <laughs> After last week's sermon title of Huey Lewis in the News, I thought I had to follow up with the Doobie Brothers this week, right? Uh, but it was funny, after it came to mind, I looked the words up to the song. I looked the words up to the song, and I found these words very interesting. You don't know me, but I'm your brother. I was raised here in this living hell. You don't know my kind in this world. Fairly soon, time will tell you. You, you keep telling me the things you're going to do. I ain't blind, and I don't like what I think I see. Uh, the second verse, take this message to my brother. You'll find him everywhere where people live together, tired in poverty and despair. Interesting words. Uh, was it Michael McDonald that wrote these words? Thank you. I've, I've got children of the 60s here, so they can bail me out. <clears throat> Michael Mc, Mc, Montgomery wrote these, not Michael McDonald. Two different people, right? It's, it's an interesting, interesting thing that he's written there. He's observing what's going on in the world, and it sounds like a Christian message. You know, art and preaching have something very similar in them, that it is a burden. Have you ever considered that preaching is a burden? It's a burden put on someone by God. And true art is also a burden that is put on somebody to bring about a reflection of what is going on. Now, you may never have thought of it as a burden. I saw it one time in a survey about preachers that it is a burden to preach. It is something that is put upon us, and it really is not our message but it is a message through us. And art is the same way. As we read today's scripture, what does Paul say at the beginning of this? If this was really my idea to preach this stuff, no, he's saying, no, the gospel is put upon me and I must preach it. That's what this whole first section is. And then what does Jesus say about this particular thing as well? He wakes up really early in the morning. He goes out and preaches, uh, prays, and then what does he say? We've got to go take this message to other places. Does that sound like something that is upon themselves or put upon them? So in many ways, to bring about the truth, to bring about these messages is a burden that is brought upon us that we must take out in the world. And, and unfortunately, if, if you do this incorrectly, you can make it all about yourself instead of what God is calling you to bring into the world. Now, I think there's a lot of times when we say things because we just want to say them. Anybody ever, and how does that work out? <laughs> Lee, I love that look. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling you. Uh, we sometimes say things because we feel like we need to get it off our chest and put the burden on somebody else. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about here is a message that is to come through us, that is move out into the world. Now, the, the next part that goes on is Paul then talks about in a very strange and dichotomic way that he is letting himself become a slave, but he is free. What the heck is this guy talking about? He's free and he's a slave. Well, which is it, Paul? That's what I want to ask him. Well, what he's talking about here is he's having to leave behind his will and be coming into other people's culture so that, that they might hear him. We, we don't realize this, but our culture many times may prevent what we're trying to say from being heard. The, the culture that we carry with us may keep somebody else from actually hearing us. And believe it or not, the way we look, the way we talk, the way we are, many times blocks the way the message comes out. And so I'm going to tell you a few stories of such things. When I was at seminary, uh, and I may have told this story, but it's a story worth telling again. Uh, my father asked me, are you going to preach while wearing a robe? True story. 
And he actually bought this robe for me while I was there at seminary. And I said, well, Dad, it depends. If they send me to preach at a contemporary service, I probably won't wear a robe. If I'm preaching at summer camp, I might be preaching in shorts and sandals. Depending on my audience, I will dress appropriately so that they can hear me. So you, you got that whole explanation? To which my dad said, good, you'll be wearing a robe. <laughs> you just kind of love that story, don't you? Uh, another person uh, told me this story about uh, the new preacher showed up, and they said, oh, great, we got one of those preachers. You probably have heard those comments before. Well, what drove the comment of we got one of those preachers? Well, underneath his robe, as he walked down the aisle, he had on cowboy boots. Amen. Yeah. We've got one of those preachers. The way we dress, the way we talk, our, our culture goes before us. Uh, at Kingwood, as we were trying to grow our, United, our, our men's group, as we were trying to grow them into more and more Bible studies, there it was a very white-collar and engineered group of men. So they'd get up real early, they'd go to work in Houston, they'd go to work for Exxon, and they were very used to business meetings. They were very used to going, traveling somewhere, and having, um, you know, one of those two or three days trainings. So what we did was, we changed our Bible studies to where they had tables all lined up. We had three ring binders with everything put in there. It, it looked like a business meeting. So that when they came in, they were comfortable. Now, one of the things that was funny when we were trying to get new guys in, they did not understand the culture of men holding hands, singing, and cooking breakfast for each other. That just whoom right by them. So what we had to do was transform what we were doing so it made them comfortable with what they were at. Now, what's interesting about being able to do that in culture is sometimes you turn the cultural barrier down so that you can turn the message volume up. You see, there's, there's only so much interference we can hear in one direction and then in the other. Now, I tried to... Uh, uh, Joseph, you asked me for another movie, uh, and I couldn't, get, I couldn't download it, but I'll just do the scene for you. <laughs> hey, that's okay. Just skip it. <laughs> or, go for it. So it's from the movie Alamo, uh, the, the more recent one, not John Wayne, but the, the one since then. And Travis is meeting with um, Bowie. Now, Bowie, how would you describe Bowie? He's kind of your rough-and-tumble Western real guy with a big knife right? So we know what his culture is. And Travis is more of a dandy. And if you don't know what that is because you're too young, you can Google it. <laughs> and so he speaks in a certain way. And there's this great scene where Travis walks up to Bowie and, and, he's, and he apologizes. He said, uh, what I did yesterday was quite unwise. And the way I spoke was quite heated. And I'd like to apologize. And he kind of goes on and Bowie goes, most of my men didn't understand the words you were using. To which then he goes on and says, I'd like to implore you that even though we're a sparsely populated garrison with few supplies, there is no reasonable way that we could uh, acquiesce to the enemy at this point. <laughs> Don't you love that? <laughs> to which Bowie goes, you know, sometimes it's just how you say it. <laughs> really. He didn't disagree with him. He was saying, look, there's no way that we can give up. But really, Travis, it's just the way you speak. See, our culture sometimes gets in the way of us trying to take the message. This is what Paul was imploring us, is that we may need to study another culture. We may need to study another people so that we can enter in so that the cultural barrier of the church does not get in the way. One final story, and this one's really kind of funny, about Morris Mathis. He was my district superintendent in Houston uh, who gladly sent me to another district. And now he's in charge of uh, church planning. And he's one of those guys that rides, uh, rides bikes, not motorbikes, bikes, you know, with black spandex. Okay, you're on, you're on board with me. And he lives in the Montgomery area, and there's a lot of really nice roads. And he, he was out riding with a friend really early in the morning. It was a cold January day, and he's riding his bicycle. And his bike breaks down, and it's in a particular part of Montgomery where there is a saloon. 
So he, he, they stop in the parking lot, and his friend rides off to go get the pickup truck to come back and get him. And poor Morris describes it this way. He was finally out there long enough, and he was freezing to death, and he was cold, and he made a rationalization. Okay, well, it's not really a saloon. <laughs> right? So he decides to go ahead, and he walks in. It's 9 in the morning, and he says, you know what? It was a saloon. And at 9 in the morning, it was full of bikers, the other kind. <laughs> He said he opens the doors and it looked just like one of those old westerns. The piano player quits playing. Everybody turns around and looks at him and they all focus on him. You can just picture this. And finally, one of the guys who's really big and near the door looks at him and says, well, what the heck are you? <laughs> uh, he later found out they were really nice guys and they, they took him in and he had breakfast and, and, and warmed up. But do we consider as the church that we may look like that to visitors. We may look like that to visitors. When a visitor comes through that door, the risk that they're taking of walk, walking through that door is, do we live up to the reputation of a church or do we live up to the reputation of the church? Do we lower our cultural barriers so that people can hear the message of the kingdom of God? So in many ways, we have to learn to teach and to reach and to step out into the world. And of course, I forget where I am right now. Those are fun stories, though. Oh, good. We're at that part. So anyway, I, I wanted to show a couple of pictures. There's one of them right here to kind of describe the church's condition right now. Uh, anybody know what this is and what the problem is? Come on, you guys know. It's a dock. And what's the problem? Yeah, the water doesn't reach it. Okay. So, um, uh, now, not that doc, the other one. <laughs> That's part of the solution. So, as the church, uh, it seems as though in our culture, the water has receded. The winds are no longer blowing people into the church. So, what are some of the things that we shouldn't do? Uh, and one of the things that I would present is we shouldn't yell at the water. Do you think yelling at the water is going to help the water come back in? No. Uh, the, another suggestion I would give you is, should we do nothing? No, good. Okay, we're on board. Okay. So we should do something. We shouldn't yell at the water. And then let's go ahead and put the solution up, or one of the previous solutions. One of the things we can do is build an outpost that's out there. This one I got off Pinterest of how to build your own dock. Okay. <laughs> in case you need one, but there's, there's an idea. There are ways that we can, as the church, reach out to different people groups. John Wesley talked about this often. I don't think I need the dock anymore. There's probably a bunch of guys going, oh, I could go fishing. John Wesley reached out in the world a lot. He was one of the people who got in trouble because he preached outdoors. He went to bars. He went to coal mines. He went out where the people were. As John Dillinger was famously quoted, why did you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Why did John Wesley go preach out in the world? That's where the people are. He took the message and he went out into the world and he brought it into the world so that people may hear what's going on. As the church, one of the things we have to come to terms with is there are people groups that we can reach. Now, when you're going to reach another people group, one of the things you have to understand and know, and you guys know this intuitively already, there are all sorts of groups out there. Uh, there are groups out there that are soccer, that are, base, that are baseball, that are um, bicycle riding, that are, uh, do you all have hobbies? There are people in all these hobbies, and one of the things that's interesting about these hobbies is they also are like reaching any other culture. They have their own language. Have you ever noticed that? They have their own language about whatever they are doing. So part of it is learning the language. Part of it is then learning the ethics of that particular group so that you may come to know them. And then learning what the problems that that particular part of the world faces. And we have to listen and hear what those problems are in those parts of the world where we live into. I'll tell, tell one quick little story about this. Uh, before we moved Deb's parents here, uh, I was talking to it about a particular person and saying, well, this is not going to be really easy because 
Moving them requires picking them up and, and moving them. And they said, oh, it'll be easy peasy. To which I responded, you have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> that was the easiest way I could put it. You, you see, because part of the move isn't just the stuff. It's the letting go. It's the emotional. That's the hard stuff. And unless you've listened, and unless you've heard, you don't understand that that is the hard parts that take place. So within our society, there are many places where we can take the gospel that these subgroups of different people are. And you all have connections in them. The question is, can we take the gospel message into those places in the world? Well, I started with the, the Doobie Brothers. Uh, I meant to mention there is what I would call unconventional preaching in this world. All of us have a burden to bring the gospel to the world and how we bring it many times is in the context that we know the people the best and they know us because that's where relationships are. So I'm going to tell you what, what I think is one of the most underrated, unconventional preachers of our century. Um, and they're about to make a movie about him with Tom Hanks starring. It's Mr. Rogers. Uh, can you think of anybody more beloved in our world than Mr. Rogers? And if you'll study what he did and what his message is, it's a beautiful thing. He saw into television and he saw what he thought was a wasteland of not very good messages. So he said, you know what? We need to transform and bring a good message to children. And he said, you know, most of the children that I knew that I would reach lived in the inner city and had difficult lives and had a hard time. And he said, so in childhood development, he went and what? He learned their problems. He went and learned about them. And then he went about bringing the message. And if you'll study what his message is, you'll hear the Christian message in it. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, right? You guys know this song. There's a beautiful day. So there is a beautiful world out there and there is beauty within it. And is that not the Christian message? God created the world and it is good. He then said, won't you be my neighbor? And Jesus said, and who is my neighbor? There is this connection that we must make. And he said, you can be my neighbor. You can be my friend. So he brought the message of friendship. He brought the message of it being a good world. And he brought a message of calmness in many places where there was nothing but chaos. And many families where there is destruction and pain and difficulty, he sat down with children and gave them a space to imagine a different world. We can bring the gospel in so many ways. My encouragement to you and, and to each of us as we come for communion today and we take Christ in, know that we take Christ in so that we are made free, but we are also made a slave to all so that they may hear the message of the kingdom. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. As we continue in worship, would the ushers come forward for the offering? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come this day a people whom you have blessed, and now we return to you a portion for your kingdom. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.